thanks for the introduction. Uh, today I'm going to talk about air code unobtrusive physical tags for digital fabrication. This is a collaboration with Evinash Nair, Sri Naya, and Chang Shijing. Tags are everywhere. Just list a few commonly seen examples here. From luggage tags, boarding passes, product barcodes to mailing labels. Tags are an indispensable part of our life. They make our travel and everyday life much easier because they carry metadata to identify objects. They create hyperlinks between physical object and digital information. For example, linking the barcode on groceries to digital pricing and inventory stock information. And sometimes even guide interaction, for instance, showing which side of the package is up or whether it's fragile. However, with all these great features, there's one caveat. Tags alter appearance and compromise on aesthetics. For example, on this beautifully designed movie poster, although the QR code can conveniently redirect us to the movie website, the intrusive QR code greatly compromised the aesthetics. Similar to 2D art designs, putting traditional tags on 3D objects also changed the appearance and introduced undesirable visual intrusion. In this talk, I will introduce an unobtrusive tagging method, air code, which are invisible to naked eyes, yet machine readable with computational imaging methods. There are, long, there are a long line of research on tagging methods. I will discuss three most related ones. The first one is Infrastruct. Willis set out embed tags using multi-material layers and decodes them with terahertz imaging. Since different materials respond differently to terahertz signals, tags can be decoded using specialized imaging and sensing equipment. The second work is acoustic barcodes from Harrison et al. They introduce structural patterns of physical notches on objects. When swiped through, the barcode formed by the notches generates a sound wave which encodes the tagging information. To facilitate interactions, instead of using tags, Affordance++ guides the user's arms using electric muscle stimulation. The desired interaction and affordance can be conveyed with real-time guidance. And different from previous work, we would like to embed tags inside the object without changing the visual appearance. To achieve invisible tags, we'll first look at how light transport and visual appearance works. Suppose we have a solid plastic slab, a slide source, and a camera. For all the rays that reflect directly on the surface, we call them direct components. This direct component dominates the visual appearance. And when lights penetrate inside and scatter, it's called subsurface scattering. It happens in all non-opaque material like plastic, fabrics, papers, or even our skins. For the rays that arrive at camera through this subsurface scattering, we'll call them global components. And in contrast to the dominant direct counterparts, the global one is usually very weak in intensity because energy is lost during the scattering process. When we take a single photo, these two parts are combined together, and the direct part contributes to the majority of the appearance. A natural idea is to embed unobtrusive tag in the global component while keeping the direct the same hoping that overall change is not perceptible. Immediately, two questions arise. How can we guarantee the tags are invisible? We can imagine that if the global part is changed drastically, the tags will still become visible. And second, since in photos, the direct and global are always combined together, how can we separate out only the global parts? Luckily for the second problem, there is already an existing separation method that solves it. By projecting different structural light patterns, for example, in this case, we use checkerboard and we take serious images, we can computationally separate out the direct and global components. And I will use this photo of a leaf to show a typical separation result. On the left is a direct component, on the right is global. We can see the direct contribute to most of the visual features, whereas the global image captures the material difference in leaf veins through light transport and scattering. This is the kind of effects we are looking for. The global components capture the underlying material difference. And now let's look at how we can actually manipulate the global components during fabrication process. Our key idea is to place air pockets inside the object. Since the air pockets are beneath the surface, the dominant direct component is unaffected. On the other hand, in a global component lies scattered beneath the surface, the global components are different at different regions will be different. Our project aims at finding the best location to put these air pockets. As an illustration, here we plot the separation result for this 1D example. X-axis is the position, Y-axis is the intensity. Since air pockets do not change the direct components, 
the direct intensity stay constant over this X range. As for global component, we will notice a drop over the air pockets because they change the light scattering behavior. And making use of this intensity difference, we can encode information. If we divide the object into three regions based on the global component intensity, we can encode zero or one in each region. And from the top view, this one, zero, one pattern look like this. And white square is the one and dark square is zero. Using this basic idea, we can construct the full air code layout. And this layout is largely inspired by QR code. It consists of three main regions, markers, data bits, and calibration bits. The four markers are used to locate the tag. We use circular shape instead of squares to increase the decoding robustness under blur and noise. The calibration bits are used to reduce distortion and improve accuracy. The remaining binary cells are data bits to store user-specified information. Putting this error code into a printed piece, and this is, the, this is our capturing system, notice that error code has several distinctive benefits. First, it's embedded during fabrication process, which means no post-processing or ex extra electronic installation is needed. Second, the tags are invisible and unobtrusive to the input geometry. Third, it can be decoded easily using consumer-level camera and projector setup. And now I will talk about how to make sure the embedded markers and beads stay invisible. This invisibility problem is closely related to the concept of contrast threshold. The definition of contrast threshold is very straightforward. It's the minimum contrast required to see the target reliably. In other words, we want the change in our global component to be smaller than the threshold. This way, the embedded tags can be seen reliably. And it turned out this invisibility problem has been widely studied in physiology and vision research. Two main factors contribute whether or not we can see a target with our naked eyes. Contrast and intensity patterns. Let's look at each of the factors. Contrast is defined as a difference between maximum and minimum luminance normalized by the space average. This is very easy to compute given an image and their pixel values. As for the intensity patterns, various patterns have been studied, such as sine waves, square waves. And notice that these primitive shapes closely resemble the typical global component of a fabricated objects. So we adopt the results and the statistics fr from the vision research. And in this, in this paper, the contrast threshold varies from 0.1% 0 0 .1 to 10%, depending on the pattern features and overall luminance. To interpret and use this result, we need to be able to predict the contrast by simulating global component of air pockets. And in order to do that, we use layered scattering model commonly used in rendering proposed by Donner and Jensen. Let's look at the first single layer case. For each layer, there are two profiles, reflection profile R and transmission profile T. Both profiles describe the ratio of outgoing energy between incident and outgoing rays. And D is the distance between incident and outgoing directions. If both the incident and outgoing rays on the same surface is a reflection, otherwise it's a transmission. This profile can be easily measured and stored in the database. To incorporate air pocket, we need to look at how multi-layer profile works. And here are two layers with different reflection and transmission profile, R1, T1, and R2, T2. The goal is to compute the combined reflection profile R because that's what's captured on camera and that's what we perceive. If a ray comes in and leaves at the top surface without transmitting to the second layer, the contribution is simply R1. This is from the definition of reflection profile. In a more complicated case, when the rays scatter into the second layer and reflect back the, the first layer and comes out, the contribution is T1 times R2 times T1. The first transmission is T1, and the reflection from the second layer is R2, and the final transmission passing through the first layer again is T1. And this is the one bounce scenario. Similarly, this extends to two bounce cases, and so on and so forth. This expression can be simplified and computed efficiently with an analytical formula. And this also generalizes easily to multi-layer profile calculations with air pockets and printing materials. Putting the pipeline together, given any multi-layer configuration, we can compute the contrast efficiently and check if it's within the contrast threshold. In our paper, we discuss more on the parameter optimization, error analysis, and the layout design. If you're interested, I encourage you to read our paper. Now I will talk about three applications enabled by air code, metadata embedding, robotic grasping, and paper watermarking. The first application is metadata embedding. 
Inside the square piece, we encode a text message which is invisible on the normal lighting, yet can be reviewed with separation method. And here is the same piece holding in my hand. In cutting it open, this visualized internal air pockets. Note that the air code can be fabricated with a single material 3D printers. And here are the direct and global components. We can see the global component is normalized just for visualization purposes, and we encode the word visibility. Air code can be further used to encode other metadata similar to those stored in photos. Now the three models can encode time, location, or what kind of printers that they are fabricated on without changing their appearance. And taking this one step further, air code tags can also be used to create hyperlinks between physical designs and digital information. In a global component image of this statue piece, the air code embeds a hyperlink to the corresponding Wikipedia page. And we envision that this connection between physical and digital world can be further explored to embed, for example, copyright information, authenticity verification, or even convey affordance for functional objects. Ergotex can also help robotic manipulators to interact with man-made objects. In robotic grasping tasks, a challenge is to recognize an object, estimate its pose, and decide where to grasp. For this unconventional triangular drawer, by embedding air code on each of the side faces, air code can not only recognize the object, but estimate the pose and decoding and doing the recoding and rectifying process. Different from traditional grasping pipeline, air code solve all these challenging issues by embedding information in the same air code tag. And this is a robotic grasping example. Is it playing? Now the air code is decoded and recognized this is a triangle drawer, knows that the 3D model and is supposed to grasp on the red edge, and it also knows the pose of this drawer. And since we do not use traditional object recognition or depth sensing, even if the handle is fully occluded in this case, we can still recognize the drawer and predict the grasping location and succeed the grasp. We also test air code on curved surface on a 3D printed mug. Again, air code can robust identify the handle even when it's fully occluded. Note that air code tags are generated in the process of fabrication so the robot can identify and manipulate the object immediately after its fabrication. And since air code is based on subsurface scattering, this means the theory can naturally extend beyond 3D printed materials. For instance, paper boxes, mass-produced plastic containers, or even cloth and fabrics. In general, as long as the materials are not fully opaque, it's possible to exploit sub subsurface light transport for tagging. As a demonstration, here we embed watermarks in a stack of papers. The embedded tags is invisible and reviewed in the global component. And this is how we construct it. The bottom two layers are simply blank papers followed by the air code layer, which is carved with a stencil to hold a hidden message. And the top layer is printed with regular visible text. And here are the separation results. To further clean up the image, we can create a binary mask from the direct image and apply standard image impending algorithm to, to review the, the underlying text clearly. While this demonstration is a simple experiment, we're excited about the potential to generalize to a wide range of materials. In summary, we propose air codes to tag physical objects. These unobtrusive tags are embedded during fabrication and can be decoded robustly with a camera projector setup. And our theory generalized to all non-opaque materials. For future work, currently the separation takes several minutes due to the structural light pattern sweeping. And we believe this will improve as we have more powerful projectors and better camera sensors in the future. And all the examples that we show are smooth surfaces. For shapes like this with very bumpy surface or very thin structure, it will be challenging to directly adopt air codes. 
and more complex geometry is a promising future direction. With physical tags, another issue is long-term preservation. The property of plastic material changes over time, especially for the 3D printed ones. For example, these two are exposed to different humidities. In our experiment, the models have been printed for almost a year, and op the optical property still holds for robust decoding, but we need more rigorous tests to understand the long-term impact. Last, since air code is embedded during the fabrication process, it's almost impossible to change once it's fabricated. So we like to investigate ways to change it without reprinting the whole structure. I'd like to thank our colleagues for their support and to Thingiverse users for sharing their models. I also want to thank NSF and Adobe for founding this research. I have some of the prints with me here. Please drop by at the end of the session to challenge yourself to see the invisible. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Right. If you have a question, please come to the microphone. So you briefly touched on this in the summary of the more complex 3D structures, right? Because all you showed was like the 2D um, air uh, text, basically. What's the problem? Is it more from the vision side, or do the pockets need to have a certain size, or what's the challenge of the structures? Uh, currently, it's most uh, the printer resolution. Hmm. Yeah, that's limiting the, the air code like bit size. Yes. Okay. I noticed that in the photos that you showed, uh, a lot of the objects are just uh, white in color. Have you had experiences uh, trying this method on different colored objects? Uh, we haven't tried other colored materials, mainly because the printer that we have only prints white material. But the theory generalized to other, like the paper we show is actually in a yellow shade. And it, it works too. So I guess it's, it's generalized to other colors too. OK, thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, Jonathan Deber, Textual Labs. Uh, it's great work. Um, well, and I was just wondering, you, so some of the examples you talked about in the future of some mass-produced items or paper that were, you know, injection molded or produced in a, in a mill, those obviously aren't conducive to the customization of each individual object that a 3D printed object would be. So I was wondering if you had thoughts about how this could be integrated with something that was an actual mass production, like injection molding, versus putting on a label or laser etching a label or something that's done after the manufacture of the mass produced objects. Yeah, we haven't really thought about the ink like modeling process, but in general, as long as the, the plastic containers, they doesn't have to be single, la single material. It could be multi-plastic that has different optical properties. It's just that in our case, we can enable this in a lot of 3D printers that only support single materials. So as long as the, the, the mass produced plastic can support like multi-material combination, then yeah our method should work. Hi, thanks for the presentation. It's really amazing work. I like it a lot. Um, so this is more like a, a thought experiment, like, um, and I guess also as a, as a, um, it's a more of a subsurface scattering question. Did you try anything uh, with different materials? Like, I don't know, like embedding um, water instead of only air or like uh, squishy materials or anything like that? Uh, yes, actually we tried with uh, the support material that's usually mm -hmm. come with most 3D printed piece. And the, the, the problem with that is in a global image, it's usually blurry because of the reflection of index. It's very similar between support and model material. And that's why we choose air, because that has the most mm -hmm. distinctive difference. Thank yeah. you.